let me tell you a little bit about my university. We're on the east coast of Canada, uh, east, uh, just east of Maine, west of Nova Scotia. Um, we have about 10,000 students on two campuses, about 2,000 graduate students. Uh, we are 233 years old, uh, one of the oldest uh, universities uh, on the continent of North America. And I'm rather proud of the fact that in 2014, entrepreneurship, not least because Dorenda, Dorenda, would you wave please? Uh, is the professor who leads uh, that organization. Uh, when he came, uh, we were he was engaged with about a dozen or so students. Uh, today we have well over 500 students involved in the programs. Uh, the programs that they have involve a uh, diploma in technology management and entrepreneurship, a five-course sequence that's open to students from anywhere in the university. The center is housed in engineering, and uh, I think that does intimidate some of the students from outside of engineering from participating, but gradually the word is getting around that you don't have to be an engineer to take these courses. And in fact, they're enormously interesting and, and challenging. We're offering a ma master's degree in TME uh, that's, uh, that's growing by leaps and bounds and attracting students, interestingly, uh, from all over the world. Um, we also have uh, something called the Summer Institute uh, that is run out of the, uh, the Herbert Smith Center where it's a, in the, kind of in the creative economy. So uh, people with ideas to start businesses and they do not, where they bring people from all over, uh, all sectors, government, private sector, NGOs, students and others, uh, to think about big problems such as literacy and poverty and try to develop new ways of tackling these big problems. And they have a kind of social entrepreneurship accelerator called uh, B for Change. I don't know, this is kind of boring recitation of all the programs that we have. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to make it exciting. The MBA that we offer, for example, has a, uh, an option for creating businesses, five-course sequence. Oftentimes, those students are paired with engineers who want to create a business. Uh, really very interesting stuff. Uh, I guess I, I, uh, I will also mention that we partnered with all of the universities and our government uh, to explore making greater opportunities for experiential education available to all the students at all of the universities in New Brunswick. Gathered private sector people, government people, student bodies, uh, and all the universities at the table to try and create something bigger than any one uh, of the schools in an effort to have a really big impact on experiential education. I think it's one of the most important uh, ways in which uh, our universities can be better. And then I'll just just a few words about the, the language we use. Uh, the words entrepreneurship and innovation can be off-putting. Uh, to some people in our university, we like to talk about change makers. We like to add the word creativity into the mix because people do need to be creative in these ventures. And, and around entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, there is a kind of thought process that it's all about making money. And, and that's, in fact, part of it, but it's not part of it. I will uh, just end there. I, I guess I would like to say what we're trying to do at our school is not make this material mandatory, but we're trying to make it sexy and contagious for our students. And one of the things I learned from Desh is make it about the students. They, they're far more of them than anybody else. But How do you motivate graduate students who go out there and, you know, get uh, a strong job working for careers? Uh, you know, to be entrepreneur or think about entrepreneurship, or are you seeing them actually asking for it? To become entrepreneurs, though I think the number one choice, of course, uh, in fact, number one meaning the number of people turning entrepreneurs <coughs> after the MBA. <laughs> the number of people turning entrepreneurs after the two year or one year MBA, which is after some experience, is the uh, I mean, you can just count in single digits. But if you take a five-year or a ten-year post, uh, you know, uh, convocating from the institution, then the percentages go up to 10 and 30 percent thereabouts. So I think the issue really, in fact, we are okay with it because I think it's good for them to go out there, learn systems, uh, you know, teamwork and whatever else that you pick up in a, a regular, you know, experience in a larger, well-set organization. Okay, but to infuse this, what we've done earlier, there used to be your elective courses in entrepreneurship. Now we have a core course on entrepreneurial mindset in the MBA program. 
everybody has to go through that. And they're quite happy with that. Um, you know, at least what does it mean to think entrepreneurship either in a startup or even maybe in a uh, well established organization? Um, that's as far as our degree program is concerned. Of course, we have a, a center for entrepreneurial learning, which has for now nearly 20 years has been in incubation. In the early years, of course, there were fewer incubators in Bangalore, and so the uh, what we call as the NSR cell, the NS Raghavan Center for Entrepreneurial Learning, used to play a bigger <coughs> role. Um, but now, with many more uh, incubation centers, the focus has moved to uh, you know incubation still continues, but we've gotten on to a product called Launchpad, which is a pre-incubation activity where people are free to come in, uh, seek mentors, many of our alums, uh, or even those who have become entrepreneurs through the NSR cell, come back and they are mentors and uh, they go through a structured, you know, three, four month program at the end of which, you know, whether their idea is workable and, you know, does it need to be uh, modified, you know, they kind of challenged on that. Uh, the other thing that NSR Cell is doing is other uh, incubation centers, we are willing to share expertise and knowledge. And uh, right now, for example, there is an MOU with the uh, center at IIT Delhi where uh, they will give us if any of our incubators need technical expertise <coughs> and if they need a business plan expertise or you know commercial go to market kind of expertise, uh, we would do that and so on. I mean, we are looking out for other uh, incubation centers where uh, this expertise can uh, flow through. <coughs> Most recently, uh, what we've done is launched a doctoral program. In fact, I think apart from an institution called the EDI, the Entrepreneurship Development Institution, which is a Central Government Funded Institute in uh, Ahmedabad, uh, we would probably be the first, definitely the first amongst the IAMs to have a focused doctoral program on entrepreneurship. And uh, the reason this has actually got uh, seeded and nurtured is because, uh, again, I think we would be the first amongst the IIMs to have a full-fledged department of entrepreneurship. Like I know I am Ahmedabad, they have it as a center where faculty from different you know, strategy, organization, behavior, or marketing, whatever, kind of connect with the center. We have, apart from that, we also have full-time faculty in the entrepreneurship center who are able to play a bridge between what the incubators and the launchpad people go through, sort of crystallize them into case studies and, and sort of bridge into the, uh, you know, education in the regular programs. And with now conceptual frameworks emerging, uh, we felt that a doctoral program is sort of uh, online. So 2018, we'll have our first batch. And I think the newer IAMs and many other management schools would are, you know, the, the sense is they would be looking for faculty who can teach entrepreneurship. Uh, of course, now, the, one of the things that the NSR cell is now beginning to say is that, and I don't know how many would agree, that maybe in the, the language in India in terms of startups is kind of gone a little over the tipping point where Everybody thinks, you know, startup is good. Uh, lots of youngsters want to do startups. But I think the issue is more with sustainability and scale up. So actually the NSR cell is trying to see, you know, how do we sort of bring this focus in. <laughs> okay, and of course, how do you make the whole thing exciting? Of course, they all go through various, you know, contests and selection. And, uh, you know, I think that brings in a lot of... Uh, I uh, you know there are many events that the NSR cell uh, plans out and that sort of gets, I think, a certain kind of excitement. Of course, thanks to the Bangalore ecosystem, I think we have, uh, you know, very good connect uh, in being able to bring in people to, uh, you know, for these events and give some uh, uh, meaning around it. And maybe uh, just one more thing I'd like to talk about and that is we also have uh, two focused domains. One is social entrepreneurship and the other is women entrepreneurship and for the women of course it's uh, coming through a CSR funding and in the first round we actually started with 1500 applicants funneled it down through a MOOC on entrepreneurship 
to about 50 who came into uh, class after three weeks of like a boot camp and I, uh, ideas were honed, presented, 12 were selected for a one year incubation. I think about eight of them have already now set up companies and that one year program is just coming to an end. Void by that, this year we are going in for 100 uh, and we brought in partners from some of the newer IAMs are partnering with us. After the boot camp, the incubators will be placed in different uh, IAM locations, primarily in uh, South India. Right. So let me. Great. Uh, wonderful. So, yeah, the cops from now wind up doing it. So it's setting that entrepreneurial foundation. The other thing, you know, formalizing the education. So with the PhD program, I think more and more, it sounds like more and more institutions are trying to adopt it, so trying to come up with pedagogy, trying to come up with best practices, trying to distill what's happening. Uh, it looks like that will really be a great contribution to the ecosystem around entrepreneurship in higher education. And then the last thing, this is the most exciting part, is the Women Entrepreneurship Initiative. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the West, back in, uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, appalling numbers in terms of both women uh, participation as well as uh, on the VC side of things. And now there's a lot of visibility to do that. So it's great to see the leadership you all are taking and making something like that happen. So let me just switch uh, So Professor Sasha uh, what, you know, given the, the technology context that you come from, what is your thoughts in terms of entrepreneurship? How does it fit within an engineering curriculum, right? From the national level, what are your perspectives on that? I think <coughs> I take back uh, from my experience as a director of uh, one of the institutions in Pune, College of Engineering, Pune. The solved by students are now taken forward by the government departments to include by furthering them into robust products. So this year, when we launched this program, we have 100,000 students who have already committed, more than 400 problem statements, including 68 hardware problems. This time we will have a software hackathon and a hardware hackathon. A hardware hackathon will be one week long hackathon wherein students will come with idea and take prototype well going out. I think that's how we have been supporting the ecosystem. This is, this is fantastic. I think it looks like in the last five years, from one uh, you know, seed that was planted by alumni to a full program, I think you can share some of that experience in uh, what you all have done. And then you know, the, the language, I think somebody mentioned, you know, we sometimes don't want to use the word entrepreneur because people get off put by that. So how do you deal with the psychology of entrepreneurship so that you can excite people? It might not be entrepreneurship. in, in that they would uh, respond to, but something else. So Steve, can you sh share your experiences? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I'll, I'll address those questions. For those of you that don't know, uh, University of Massachusetts Lowell is located in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is about 30 miles north of Boston, uh, back in the USA. Uh, and we're about uh, 18,500 uh, undergrad, graduate, and online students. We have a pretty big online program, and about 25,000 enrollments a year in that. Uh, and we're a full university with uh, undergraduate, masters, and PhD programs in uh, six across six professional schools. Uh, and we have our roots in the textile industry, which the industrial textile revolution started in Lowell in the early 1800s. Um, but to Raj's point, it's a, how many faculty are in the room right now? Oh, good, only a few. <laughs> I, I can raise my hand. I can say it almost anything. No. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, we offer the same uh, complement of programs such as UNV and IIM and Queens. We have an undergrad program in entrepreneurship, we have a master's of science in entrepreneurship, we have a certificate program, and we have a PhD. Um, but an interesting thing, if we only relied on students who were accepted into academic entrepreneurship programs to start businesses, we would not have enough businesses to survive. Uh, and the challenge here is that our curriculum tends to structure things in a very developmental step-by-step -step model uh, with restrictions that sometimes make, it makes it difficult um, for students to be entrepreneurial. And it's very challenging for faculty to be entrepreneurial because of some of the, the, the restrictions, our academic process, uh, tenure, and research, and those types of things. Um, so having those core academic programs is important but it only addresses part of the challenge. So I think a, a big lesson that we've learned a long time ago was sort of the need to work outside the curriculum 
as well as inside the curriculum. And so those academic programs are very good at sort of teaching the method uh, and the science and the giving somebody a professional degree that they need in order to progress in their professional career. But having hackathons and pitch contests and uh, exchange programs with other universities. We're, uh, KLE, we're partners with KLE, a group of UMass Lowell students just left campus a couple weeks ago. We bring 200 international students to Lowell every summer for an immersion experience in entrepreneurship. Um, the idea there is, is to create opportunities for our students to collide with other students and to work on these, um, uh, these ideas that excite them, on the problems that they want to solve. I think the other piece um, that's important and the difference between extracurricular versus curricular activities. So the extracurricular activities tend to be a just-in-time model, right? If someone's doing something because they're volunteering to do it, because they want to do it, you don't have to force them to come for knowledge. They come to Bard because they want it and they need it. Whereas if you're getting, trying to get students to study for an entrepreneurship test, believe me, I've heard all, I teach as well, so I've heard all the complaints about that. Uh, so I think it's important when we, we think about the types of programs that we're really building out a whole range of activities. I think the other um, aspect of this journey that's important is to sort of think about the whole range of activities. At Lowell, we had people doing many different things, right? So we had faculty teaching courses. We had faculty doing business plan competitions. We have our student difference maker program, which is all extracurricular for any student on campus, whether they're a business major, or a nursing major, or a philosophy major. And when you use the word entrepreneurship, it brings differently to different people. In fact, when I first moved into my role um, championing entrepreneurship on campus, I was talking to a bunch of finance, humanities, and social science majors. And a young man at the end of the talk, I thought I had done a great job, you know, at the end of the talk, uh, Tom's laughing over there because he thinks I always think I do a great job. Um, at the end of the talk, a young man stands up, he goes, excuse me, Professor Tello, but I'm a sociology major, and I don't understand what this entrepreneurship stuff has to do with sociology. Well, the poor guy, he didn't know I was an undergrad sociology major. I was supposed to be an engineer, it didn't work out. I ended up as a sociology major. So it was perfect, right? But what that one statement said to me is that we have to be careful about the language that we use when we talk to people from different frames or different spheres about entrepreneurship. We might, the, the six of us may be thinking something different when we use that term, entrepreneurship. Some people are thinking about technology commercialization. Some people are thinking about creating an entrepreneurial mindset in freshmen. Some people are thinking about investment capital. Some people are thinking about supporting socials and nonprofits. But we use this one term that just covers the whole territory. So I think in our institutions and in our programs, we need to think of organizers, way of organizing our activities. So at low, we use to use something simple. We break it up into raising awareness, developing skills, and launching ventures. And so our Difference Maker program, which works with about 5,000 students a year, focuses on raising awareness. And we do fun activities. We do Lego activities, thinking toy activities, hackathons. Little things that get people excited and start thinking, this might be fun. Then we move into developing the skills. So we teach them about business model canvas, we teach them about opportunity assessment, those types of things. And if that student or that faculty or that external entrepreneur who's working with us gets excited, then we can move them into the launch phase. And there we can start to focus resources on them, whether it be venture funds or loans or space or other people that they need to make the venture. So I think it's a combination. It's being cautious about the language and thinking about using language that invites people from different uh, spheres to participate in the process, and then also staging your investments in their venture as they move along through these different paths. Great. So I think uh, a combination of extracurricular and that gets people thinking about it, and then eventually as they accelerate, push them down the path. Uh, so Lizo, uh, you know, we have had all these institutions talk about it, but you're the product of institutions and you're working with the people who are going to be the input for some of these institutions maybe. So tell us a little bit about how you're working with youth in, in Nagaland. So, I just want to check, if any person can come in, you're always invited to stay with me. Um, we have a co-working space that we launched last year, and it's been about 18, uh, it's been about 12 months, and we don't even have a single member who signed up for the co-working space. The context of entrepreneurship for us is totally different. As a kid, when I grew up, I just want to share the story that whenever I came home for Christmas, and we had Christmas dinner, it used to, and I come from a family 
of four uncles and four aunties, including my father. And we always had Christmas at the eldest uncle's house or the second uncle's house. And every year it was that way. And I, I just didn't understand why we were always eating at the same uncle's house all the time. And I asked my family, why can't we eat at my place or why can't we eat at someone else's house? And they, the story that I got from them was they are government officers. And so they have a lot of money. The narratives of conversation that we have in the Northeast is totally different because of because there's no IIT, there's no IIM, there's no engineering college, there's no medical college. And so for many, many years, there's just been no structured institution that's been helping us churn out entrepreneurship. The work that we do is trying to focus around telling young people that you know entrepreneurship is also an option. Uh, we need role models. Uh, most of the role models that we have are politicians or corrupt officers who have a lot of money and fancy cars and so young people aspire to be like them one day. And so the whole idea is we intervene at school level where we have uh, entrepreneurs who are still struggling, but they come up to the stage and they talk to young people about what are the challenges, what are the opportunities. We work with college students as well. We have uh, a competition called, which is called the first cut where we give them seed money. They compete uh, for 10 days during this famous Pondal Festival. And the winners get an educational trip to go to a city like Hyderabad or to Bangalore and meet some entrepreneurs and connect with them. And over the years, our whole idea is how do we bring this conversation that entrepreneurs can also be successful. However, last year we had a really big impact because one of our young entrepreneurs unfortunately committed suicide. Because she was young, she was getting famous, she had so much pressure and she couldn't take the pressure. And so now what we're trying to realize that entrepreneurship, when we talk about the success, we also need to talk about the failures of entrepreneurship. We need to talk, we need to tell stories that everybody cannot be an entrepreneur. You know, we need people in the private sector. And you can only do that by showing role models out there. Yeah, we're fortunate, you know, we have a center in the US which works in some of the poorer cities and that's what it does. We call it entrepreneurship for all. So it doesn't matter whether you have a rocket ship idea or whether you have an idea to just open up a neighborhood a laundry. Uh, you still are an entrepreneur, you need the same kind of guidance and help, right? So it's commendable what you're doing. And, you know, I'd like to just, before we turn over to the question, uh, Greg, maybe you can give us a quick snapshot of Queens too. And I know you're also dealing with young entrepreneurs, much like Lizo is. So what, what are we doing in Queens? Well, I, it's, it's always interesting to me, especially when I'm, I'm in a... You tend to see the differences first, and that, that becomes interesting dinner table conversation, all that sort of thing. but. I think the opportunities to, to cross collaborate and to share best practices come from observing the commonalities yeah, and yeah. listening to the, the, the approaches you've all taken in your in your challenges. I you know I see lots of commonalities. I um, I think universities are uh, in some ways the, the very best places to uh, to incubate entrepreneurs. I mean we work with the uh, the brightest, the most energetic, the most optimistic. Uh, the most promising people in our, in our respective regions. But in other ways, they're, they're, they can be very challenging places to incubate engineers. We, um, uh, we often get people who are, uh, who, who are risk averse, uh, uh, whose lives have gone generally pretty well. So our approach at Queen's, I think, has a, a lot of commonality with, with what you've done. Um, we have students who, there's no doubt that they're able to to get the necessary mastery of the academic thing that they're studying. And there's no doubt that they're able to get the necessary mastery of the tools of entrepreneurship. But what's really missing is the experience. Uh, often many of them have never experienced significant failure in their life. Uh, so to be confronted with that is, is not just a possibility, but a likelihood. Uh, it, you know, it's a very important experience to give them. So I think this, this mix of, of curricular and experiential, extracurricular stuff is very important. Um, I think uh, what you pointed out, Raj, the, the importance of, of providing, you know, inviting language and, and inviting programming with the, with the breadth of, uh, of access is very important as well. And uh, these are all things that we've incorporated in Queens and, um, uh, and seem to be working pretty well for us. So it's, it's reassuring to, um, to hear that all of you have so much more experience than, than me working at universities and, and incubating entrepreneurs have, have, have taken some similar approaches. That's great. So, uh, you know, just a couple of observations, then I'll open up to questions. So, you know, entrepreneurship, if you ask real entrepreneurs who have been successful for their honest kind of life story, almost 
all of them will say, uh, you know, along the way there are multiple failures. So I think, uh, you know, the, the university, the college, the higher education environment is a, in some ways a safe zone where you can condition students to think about that, try out things that are outside their comfort zone so that when they fail, they can fail in a safe, safe place. But they get used to that and they pick themselves up and try something else again. Because I think, you know, Lizo, as you made the point, right, it's important to know that, you know, for every successful entrepreneur out there, there are literally 90 plus entrepreneurs who have failed because that's the success ratio for entrepreneurship in general. Uh, so right up front, we need to condition them to think about that, that, yeah, your first thing might not be a home run, but the second or the third or the fourth one will. Just keep persisting, right? So let me just open up with one question to all of you. Uh, and especially since this is the Desh Pandey Foundation and with Desh behind it, uh, how do you, when you think of what you're doing right now, uh, how do you think you can grow what you got uh, so that it becomes more than what you are? So how does it become a regional thing? How does it become a national thing? How do you think of scale? How does that help with what you're doing? So anyone can feel free to, you know, jump in. Uh, I'd like to take that on, Raj. I, I, I movement to promote these values all around the world, and in particular at our university. I think universities are increasingly recognizing they have a role to play uh, in economic development and the commercialization of our research, in using ideas around social entrepreneurship to bring to bear on really pressing long-standing social problems. Uh, and it, I, the more I travel, the more I run into people at universities around the world that are building these programs, uh, and I believe by trading people around from institution to institution globally, uh, we can spread a lot of really good ideas around. The implementation and execution of those ideas will vary from culture to culture, but uh, the flow of people, I think, will really, really help advance this particular cause and make a really big difference. Uh, just one more thing. The people really count. The people that we put in front of our students inspire them, they really matter. So if we find the right people to convey these ideas in the right language, we will make huge progress. Eddie, are you just offering something in terms of the cross-global uh, comment that you just made? Is that an open invitation? Yes. <laughs> so we ought to take Eddie up on that. So if, uh, you know, if your institutions are interested in seeing how we can collaborate, take some of the uh, entrepreneurship that we have learned here, share it with the people, you know, uh, Durendra is over here, uh, Dominic's over here. What can we do together? What can we learn from each other? Because I think that's how we grow it. Right? Any other comments in terms of how you scale? Like what, what do we do, uh, you know, at the national level? How do we take these things and? In fact, we were planning this year itself, because we, we had time, no constraints. So next year, they will be at least in six countries. We'll have a simultaneous hackathon happening from India. Using the problems. same problems that... Uh, yeah, the same problems. Awesome. So that's going to be our next step. So and as far as uh, national level is concerned, we have already instituted startup awards for college startups. So this time, it was held in Chennai. Eleven startups were awarded out of the 100 odd increase that we received. And we want to support them further, and that's why we have signed up a MOU with South Korea. We took 11 startups to South Korea for one week for training for the South Korean ecosystem of startups. Similarly, we are working with Dalton University in Canada, and likely when the Prime Minister is listening next month, and this month is February, there is likely to be an MOU between Canada and India for startup similarities you know, of that nature. Especially, they want to support women startups. I think there are various ways which we can take forward for making this a national movement. And I think uh, your problem, I think IITs, IIM should support people from North East or anywhere, wherever there are no facilities, in their incubators and support strong mentorship program. Actually, mentorship is very important. When chips are down, I think someone should pat them and say that, you know, well, well, you know there may be a failure, but let us have another startup, you know, so that's what is required. So, when we said scale up, I'm going up to, to my way of looking at it, which is, I think the, the startup, I mean, scaling up startups uh, in terms of numbers, I think now I see the country is on a roll, actually. And it will happen. I mean, more needs to happen, no doubt, but it's happening. 
the issue is of uh, scaling up a particular startup, uh, taking it beyond the sustainability uh, tipping point. And there I think actually management schools that are kind of well established who naturally have been working in a way, you know, looking at larger organizations, uh, but now also looking at entrepreneurship have a natural connect. And I think uh, focusing by some of the IAMs and other management schools in working with entrepreneurs to uh, challenge the sustainability and, and scaling up, that is uh, doable. The other on the northeast, actually, I just happened to be in Mizoram uh, two days ago, and uh, I think it's great. And uh, you know, the, the, there's a certain aspiration there. Um, so I don't know if I am Bangalore would be, you know, we could talk, and if there could be a location, I don't know how Nagaland and Mizoram and Manipur or whatever can get together, but that's a possibility. Yeah. That's, I'm super excited. So I'll definitely be in touch. Uh, last week, before I came here, uh, we, si uh, we signed a contract with uh, a company in Japan to s uh, train young people from Nagaland to go to Japan because the population there is 48 and they want young people. Uh, China, across the border, is there are young kids in China who are learning how to speak Hindi because that area from where I come is going to expand. And I definitely, I, I'm very, very grateful you know, to be here for, for this conversation to start. The Northeast has not been, and there's fantastic opportunities. So if there are organizations and institutes, and we welcome you, you know, if you want to come, I'm more than happy. We work with governments, we work with institutes, we work with tribal leaders, and if there's opportunity, I'm really excited. The world is becoming interdependent, sir, and we also want to be a part of this change that's happening. Before, we were in our own silos, happy with our own little things, but now with the power of the internet and technology, our young people look at things and say, you know, I want to buy the next iPhone 7. I don't really know if it's a great thing or not. But the conversations of our young people are, we are optimistic. We have a young population. We're really, really excited that, you know, in, in terms of opportunity in the Northeast as well, there's so much that can be done. Ackman Foundation has identified 100 young leaders in India uh, who have come, come, you know, are socially motivated and doing great stuff, and he's one of them. So we're really fortunate to have him. There's a platform called Swayam, which has been set up by the Ministry of HRD with the support from AICT. And this platform has more than now 900 odd courses. There would be courses on entrepreneurship. They would be available at nook and corner of the country. Anyone can take those courses. Are they organized? They are, they are organized properly. They are remote sourcing and they are all free of cost for everyone. So there is no charge for them. My question to all the academicians sitting here. Uh, the lot of effort has been done here to link education with entrepreneurship and I was one of the fortunate ones to link uh, CBSC and NCRT to link education and the school system entrepreneurship. My question too is that what are efforts being taken to train the faculty and the teachers to teach entrepreneurship? It should be taught by entrepreneurs and not the faculty members. And therefore, uh, the example which we set up in College of Engineering today was uh, the course was handled by the first generation entrepreneurs who went to all the halls, had lots of challenges, problems, overcome them. They were the teachers for this course, not the regular teachers. Regular teachers also attended. If they attend the course for about five years, then probably they will become teachers for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree with that as a starting point, but I think. There are conceptual inputs and the faculty. Uh, so we are doing a, a doctoral program, that's one. And number two, as I said, we already have uh, faculty who have done their thesis on entrepreneurship, either from a strategy domain or a marketing domain or whatever, to form the core of our entrepreneurship department and they teach. But definitely their course would be uh, more than flavored with visiting entrepreneurs to uh, you know highlight a certain concept or whatever from their experience. So that is how the course would be run. Uh, but I think uh, we there is a certain uh, mindset and there are concepts behind it. Uh, I think your point is still valid. How do we uh, teach somebody to teach entrepreneurship? Yeah. So I guess I would add going back to what I had said earlier, the people who teach depends on the stage of the individual that you're teaching. 
And so there are periods where you can, where faculty actually do a great job. If you're teaching a pro forma, if you're teaching an accounting method, uh, if you're doing team uh, building education, faculty know how to do those things. But if you're trying to raise awareness early on and trying to get freshmen excited when they first get on here, you probably don't want to put your key entrepreneurship researcher in front of them. And so sort of thinking about what stage they're at and thinking about when do you bring mentors in, when do you bring alumni in, when do you bring... We have some very well, uh, Harish Hadi, for example, is one of our alumni. I bring Harish in when I want him to excite a room of a thousand people. I don't bring him in to do the weekly workshop on business opportunity assessment. So thinking about who you're educating, what level they're at, will help you to select the type of that. What we've tried to do is, is blend the entrepreneur with the academic in the same setting. And we try and do that uh, in, a, in a way that understand and appreciate the context. So, so when we go into a social entrepreneurship environment, we make sure we bring a social innovator, a change maker in that context so people can relate to that and understand and appreciate that context. And when we go to a high tech component, we bring an uh, uh, entrepreneur that can understand and appreciate the context. So when you're, you're looking at your own programs, make sure you bring in entrepreneurs that understand and appreciate the context. Sometimes the resources available are centered around what's happening in the Silicon Valley and might not apply to your context and you always feel that you don't have the resources and things like that. But there are uh, platforms like Audacity that can help you and Lean Launchpad and if there are resources that we can provide that would be great. But look at a blended model that would be very useful. It's being done in many parts of the university is changing dramatically. We see multidisciplinary teams who deliberately and intentionally set out to work with many people outside the university in order to address the problems that confront us with all kinds of different groups. Uh, the best of our students are involved in those exercises. The best of those students become our faculty. So in some sense, uh, uh, that is really doing things differently. And those people are thinking entrepreneurial. Whether that word arises in the work that they're doing, they're really trying to make big social change or, or make big change what, of whatever kind. And by working together in those contexts, they're going to come out with that kind of we can change this by working together attitude, uh, regardless of discipline. And that gives me a great sense of optimism. So I, 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 it, it's a subtle thing, but I, I really believe it is happening. Some of the exhibits are entrepreneurial uh, areas, great, which, you know, I see in all the leaders when I when we first met Eddie, that's what we saw in him, you know, and I think that's one of the most important parts when you think about imbuing entrepreneurship within your uh, academic institution. It has to come from the top with support from the top. So having people like, you know, Professor Ramaraman and having, you know, Eddie take the leadership and say that entrepreneurship is important makes it happen. You know, and having people like uh, Steve Dello, who, you know, he came up through the ranks, but he has been Mr. Entrepreneurship at U.S. Well. So, wonderful. Greg, do you want to add some comments on what you've heard or anything on the record or on the stuff itself? And value the precious resources that we have. Uh, I think it's important that we're sensitive to what our markets really need from us, what problem it is that we're solving. Uh, and, and the value of our solution has to exceed its price. Uh, in some cases it doesn't. We've all seen examples of that. Um, the third thing that, I, that I, I see that we that we maybe preach more than we uh, practice is is the importance of diversity on a team. That was that was raised in the question about uh, teaching teachers to be to teach entrepreneurship. Uh, it's that sometimes you need that 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 seasoned entrepreneur who's who's hit a couple of home runs. Sometimes you need that skilled, passionate educator. Uh, sometimes you need that technician who can give the accounting lecture. And it, like in entrepreneurship, the diversity on the team is, is its strength and its, its willingness to acknowledge each other's strengths and backstop each other's weaknesses is what will take it through times of, of rapid growth and very challenging times. So I think it was interesting to see that, that theme come out. So before I thank the panel, I should just point me to point out, uh, you know, Greg is the executive director of the center that we have uh, set up at Queen's University, and sitting over here is uh, Jim McClellan. He's the faculty director, so they work together. You know, Greg's, Greg brings a, uh, you know the uh, 
business expertise from the practical being an entrepreneur, being a CEO before he joined uh, Queen's University. And Jim has worked in engineering, but he has been following and he has several entrepreneurial spin-offs coming out of the work that he's done. So it, you need that combination between, you know, practical experience in entrepreneurship together with what the academics are uh, underpinnings for. So I'd like to at this point thank the panel. It's been wonderful. Thanks a lot for...